Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. I'm very excited to be able to share some strategies and ideas with you as far as instructional practices go in that balanced approach to instruction. Uh, my name is Kathy Bumgardner, and I again am very pleased that you're with me. The major thing to know today is that we're talking about the importance of the classroom and of the fact that teachers matter most to student learning. I always say, you know, no pressure, but it is definitely our responsibility to make sure that our students are getting the best possible instruction they can get every day, without a doubt. So this is this is me, and this is my website, kbumreading.com. Uh, it's uh, a free website. Uh, I always tell people it's a little bit of a hot mess sometimes because it's definitely a teacher geek website, but lots of uh, Read things there um, and things that I share with you. A lot of things I'm going to be talking about today uh, you'll be able to find uh, and download from that website. Being a teacher is easy. It's like riding a bike, except the bike's on fire, you're on fire, and everything's on fire. That's the reason that we need constant support from each other about how to make sure our classrooms are running the way they need to run. Because the best Part of teaching is that it matters. But as Todd Whitaker said, the hardest part of teaching is that every moment matters every day. So without a doubt, when I'm working in schools, I find that teachers are really always cognizant of the fact that time is almost like their enemy sometimes. There never seems to be enough time. And I know that Every year in the classroom, in every grade level I ever taught, that was always the issue for me. So finding ways to make that time optimized and to the best possible use of it I could have was so important. And understanding that teaching in itself is an incredibly complex endeavor because nobody has it nailed. There's no one, no one person who has the perfect teaching style, who has the perfect teaching ideas, who has the perfect classroom. This is the thing that really I have found to be the most helpful part of any teacher's thinking is that there are always ways to get better. We're always trying to find things that will make our instruction even more effective and make our kids more engaged and empowered daily. I love it that Maya Angelou said, do the best you can until you know better, and then when you know better, you do better. So every time I would have issues in my classroom, I was always looking for something that might be able to problem solve what those issues might be. And when I find a good solution, it was great. And, and the next time, those lessons went even better because I had found another way to make it happen. So today, our whole little session is about reflecting on instruction because instruction is where the rubber meets the road. But the thing is, we want to be able to reflect on it realistically. You know, in the state of Texas, the standards are there, and, and the things that our kids have to accomplish is there. It's just that we have to have that balance of how we use our time, how we use our resources, and how we make that happen. So I want you to think about this. I want you to think about when you walk in classrooms, whether it's your classroom or if it's another classroom in your school or your building or in your district, you know, what do you see when you walk in those classrooms? What do you see? Who do you see doing the work? What are the kids doing? Are they sitting around waiting on someone to tell them what to do? Is it a quiet classroom where everybody's being very well behaved but there's not much conversation going on? Um, is who's, who's doing the writing? Who's doing the thinking? Those are the things we want to think about because we have to balance that out. And that's that can be a difficult chore sometimes. Also understanding that knowledge is power. You know, this teaks, what do we know? We, we got to know what to teach. What is expected each and every grade level? What are those things? What are those standards? What are those skills and strategies that our kids need to be good at? And how do we teach it? You know, how do we make that happen? And many times that depends on where we are, the diverse population of students that we have, and how we can make that happen. But we always need to be able to have things we can access and things we can do to make it better. In the TEKS, it talks about reading, and I, and I like that it says that reading is where students read and understand a 
wide variety of literary and informational texts. Now, that's our first piece of balance. We know now that we have to have that balance, that we have to have as much informational reading, sometimes even more than we have literary reading, in order to ensure that our students are getting that balance of literature and informational text and the knowledge of how to read that text. Those strands of reading, writing, oral and written conventions, research, and listening and speaking. Together, we have to balance our time and our resources in our classrooms to, manage, to ensure that we are involved in each of those aspects on a daily basis with our students, each and every day. So what do we talk about when we say a balanced approach to literacy instruction? What does that include? What does that look like? Well, it depends on, you know, what you're looking at, who you're talking to. Uh, it's, there's so many common threads that run through it, but there's also different language sometimes. But overall, pretty much everybody has different terminology for it, but we always are talking about the fact that a balanced approach includes a variety of instructional strategies. That means everyone has some great things that work and some things that, that our districts and our schools support. We, have, we use a variety of instructional materials. More than ever, there are so many choices of things that we have out there that we use, and, and with a diverse population of students, we need to have that. We use multiple books, we use literature, we use information, we use leveled readers, we use picture books, online reading, magazines, journals, newspapers. It goes on and on, and that proficient teacher understands how to pull in those texts and expose her students to the variety of the reading that is in our lives today. We talk about a, an authentic and explicit teaching and meaningful literacy activities and tasks on a daily basis, meaningful being the key word here. A variety of instructional approaches. I think every time I hear someone use different terminology for what they call their balanced instruction, this always comes back to the fact that we have a time when we are addressing our kids in whole class. Some Folks use more time than others to do that, but that balance is so important because we know how valuable that small group instruction can be and how much we can learn from our students by having that time, that small window of time where we can be there listening in to those groups, those small groups, and getting that one-to-one -one individual time also in, included in that small group from time to time. But that's definitely one of the things we talk about when we talk about a balanced approach. We also talk about the fact that we have development of students' foundational skills. We have to balance that in there regardless of what age students we're teaching. We sometimes encounter the issues of foundational skills that are not there and the knowledge that we need to help our students to, to gain when they, when they are lacking in those. Um, word study, vocabulary, phonemic awareness, phonics all have to be done somehow within that authentic, explicit teaching with extended independent and collaborative liter literacy activities and tasks. So just saying that every day we're planning our time. How are we planning our time? We're planning our time to include authentic, explicit teaching and allowing our students to be a part of that with that daily emphasis on listening, speaking, reading, thinking, and writing. Basically, that integrated language arts is all in there together because that is what time requires. And there's so many things to do, but we have to do it in a way that it works, a way that it sticks with our kids. You know, reading and writing with our students and reading and writing by our students. That balance has to be there. Read alouds are fabulous. But if all we do all day long is read aloud to our kids, they're not going to be able to read it for themselves. And so we want to make sure that balance is happening and that they're t also carrying that on hopefully outside the school and having that continuation of being able to read and write and reading and writing independently by themselves as well as reading and writing collaboratively with others. More than ever, we understand, I would say, in this upcoming school year of 2018-19, one of the biggest pushes, many of the places that I work, deal with the fact that we want our kids to, collabor to collaborate successfully with each other, learn to have those educational conversations 
to be able to enrich themselves and learn from each other with the teacher coaching and assessing and standing to the side and making sure that those things are going well. I love this little saying that says, diverse problems require diverse tools. It is tempting if the only tool you have is a hammer to treat everything as if it were a nail. And i got to say that I have unfortunately encountered many classrooms that, that were struggling to, to meet their students' needs sometimes, and, and part of that was because they just didn't have enough strategies. They, they were trying to do what I kind of call spray and pray, like using the same thing. It's, that doesn't work in a doctor's office when people go in with different ailments, and it certainly isn't going to work in a classroom. So we want to be able to have, you know, different things that work for our students and, and best practice that work for all of our students. So I love my little, my little picture here where, and I always say, hey, you can bring them the water. You can get them to drink. You just have to put the right stuff in the bowls. We can get our kids where we need for them to go, but we have to also motivate. Motivation is a huge part of teaching. It's one of the reasons that I am such a big advocate of literacy tools for teaching and for learning. I always say, I came up with some of these things that I do out of desperation. I was desperately trying to get my students to take away and sustain and transfer those things, that those skills and strategies that I was teaching them. And I found that if I had something that I was using to demonstrate it, that they could see it, that was visible, that they could also take that and go away and use it and learn from it and continue learning from it and share it with others. Because in a normal classroom, for the most part, there's one teacher and many more students. One of me, bunch of you. I always told my kids that because that is the fact. So many of these tools came from that. And as you just look at some of the tools that are there, you know, there's 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 literacy work boards, there's uh, speaker listener cards, there's fast characters, there's foldables, there's think marks, there's fix up strategies. Um, all of these things are things that I teach, that teachers teach but there are also ways to be able to revisit what we've taught and to have the kids to have a visible and a hands-on thing that helps them to sustain and carry on that. Um, think aloud clouds, questioning, all the things we're going to talk about. These are just tools that help to hammer that down so that kids have a better chance to sustain it. Uh, the graphic organizers such as these foldables um, help our students to know how to take the knowledge that we are giving them and be able to put it into an organizer in an organized way. Text evidence finders. The funny thing about these are I've, been, I've gone through TSA um, security before and had my bag pulled where I had some of my text evidence finders that were in there. As you can clearly see, if you aren't familiar with these, they are, they are laminated. Um, and they're simply tools that the kids knew, use to find uh, text evidence with the teacher observing and then with each other. And I've had the TSA people pull it up and say, hey, this, these, aren't, these aren't real. Well, yeah, no, they're not real magnifying glasses. However, they are real text evidence finders, and they do help our kids to be able to zero in on that text evidence and be able to uh, share it. it makes it kind of fun. They're locating that text evidence, and it just gives them gives them that little gimmick. It gives them that little mnemonic device, something to help them remember uh, what they're doing and and why they need to do it. Another thing so important is the questioning. Without a doubt, if there is something that can improve instruction in a classroom, it is how teachers question. Unfortunately, we get so busy and tied up with what we're doing in our classroom sometimes that we tend to talk too much. Teachers talk too much. We, if we don't, you didn't get that, let me say it louder. Let me say it um, a little slower. No, we need to give our kids a chance to process it. And one of the best ways to find out if they are processing is through questioning. Some teachers ask between 200 and 300 questions a day, but you know, most students only ask about two questions a day including sometimes, uh, can I go to the bathroom and, and what time is lunch? Uh, but I love this saying that says that you teach more by the questions you ask 
than by the statements you make. Wow. So that is simply telling us that as teachers and instructional people, we want to be able to ask powerful questions, questions that cause our kids to think, questions that cause our kids to think beyond where, where it is and be able to go deeper into a topic and be more interested and also to be able to figure out how they're doing with that. In the TEKS in kindergarten, it addresses questioning. It's, all, it's not just something extra you do. It's not just best practice that you do. It's also part of the standards. It's part of what we are expected to teach our kids to be proficient in. In kindergarten, we want them to be able to ask and respond to questions about the text. That's important. In first and second grade, we want them to be able to ask literal questions about the text. And asking questions is much more difficult and complex than just um, answering questions. In fourth and fifth grade, we're asking literal, interpretive, and evaluative questions of text. Wow. And that there's so much involved in that. But they have to learn how to do that. They, are, they don't come into school knowing how to ask those levels of questions and those various uh, types of questions. That takes instruction. It takes really good instruction. You know, fifth says ask literal, interpretive, evaluative, and universal questions of text, universal questions, questions that go beyond just the basic thing that we're looking at and leads us into more questions and more answers. One of the literacy tools that I have, I call, I call them hot questions or guiding questions, and I really came up with these and made them into a ring because I realized that I was forgetting to ask these text-dependent questions, questions that keep kids in the text. Questions that don't allow them to answer yes or no, but rather they have to be able to, to go further and elaborate. So, for instance, one of my favorite ones there is, tell me why you think that. So when a kid says, is this right? And they point to something, you know, I now, since I've used these rings so many times, I've, I've gotten pretty good at it. But, you know, it, I always ha like to have them around as a reminder to ask that. And the, the kid will go, tell me why, and I'll say, tell me why you think that. And the student will say, um, well, um, is it not right? I said, I didn't say it was not right. I said, I was just wondering where you found that. Can you show me that? And, and it's like a non-threatening way to get them to go back into that text. So asking questions, as you can see, the ones that are there in that way is really a great strategy to use. Uh, also in my, on my website, I have something called Bloom's Big Bucks. And they're just simply Bloom's taxonomy, the revised taxonomy, and the uh, the text, the uh, tool themselves have the different question stems that go with the different levels. And for instance, a remembering question is worth $5. Um, and if, uh, creating, inventing question is worth $500. That's the highest level. And so those question stems, they don't have to look them up. They're there. And the teacher can, even in a kindergarten class, can have those uh, available and walk around and say, let me ask you a $100 question. Let me ask you a $5 question. Oh, now let me ask you a $500 question. Because you have to think at a, at, a, at a more intense rate in order to answer those questions at those higher levels. And it's a great way for the kids and a fun way for the kids to figure that out. Um, when we talk about visible teaching and learning, um, I'm taking all these tools, these things we use, these, whatever other types of tools you may use in your classroom, and making sure that I have those available, that I am referencing those. So the kids have something to go back when I'm not there with them to reference. I want to make what I'm teaching very visible to them. So that's what you see me doing here. I'm, I'm, I'm making sure that those students know what genre we're talking about. I want them to know what comprehension strategy we're talking about. I want them to know uh, what questions I would like for them to be thinking about while we're reading that. And I'm going to help them to organize that thinking. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll do that in whole group, and I'll also do that in small group, because I want them to have those visibles. And I also think it's really important for us to understand that whoever is doing the reading, the writing, and the talking is doing the thinking. And without a doubt, learning is a consequence of thinking. So what I find many times is that when I'm in classrooms and I'm, I'm, teachers have asked me to come and, and, and work with them, I find that, that many times it is because they are talking too much. The kids are not doing enough of the thinking that sometimes we tend to over-nurture them rather than give them an opportunity for some meaningful struggle. So I think that when we think 
about how learning is a consequence of thinking, that is very important. I love this saying that says, the quieter you become, the more you can hear. So talk about an area that needs balance. That is an area that needs balance, that student-teacher talk. When I go do lessons, I really strive to try to make sure in those classrooms that those students are having an opportunity to talk as much as I do because their talking is very important to their learning. I want to engage them. I want to empower them. I want to give them ownership of their own learning, and that is very important. Understanding that engagement isn't something you do to students. It's something you do for students. So even when I am teaching whole class, I want them to be a part of that lesson. I don't ever want them to be sitting back taking little vacations. Instead, I want to be able to involve them. When I'm teaching small groups, same thing. I want to give them chances to talk to me. I want to give them chances to listen carefully and then get a chance to talk with each other. We talked about earlier about how important it was for small group to also turn into an opportunity to meet with our individual kids and lean in and listen makes it very easy to do when you have them sitting there right there in front of you. In this slide, my advice to teachers and fellow educators is that many times during the day, I also advise teachers that I work with on a regular basis to stop at different points during the day and ask yourself, who, who's doing the work right now? Is it me? Am I doing all the work? Am I doing the talking? Am I doing the reading? Am I doing the thinking? And am I telling them what to think? Or are they engaged in it too? So who is doing the work? And you look at this picture, you can see the teacher is supporting and the child is doing the work. Who's doing the talking? When you look at this picture from a classroom, definitely those kids are doing the talking. They're reviewing things together. The teacher hasn't left that left the classroom, she is there, she, she or he is leaning in, listening. It's a great way for formative assessment, you know. And who's doing the thinking? This picture reminds me of how much of a struggle it has been for me in my whole teaching career to give my kids think time. It was such a hard thing to do, and it continues to be a difficult thing to do because that silence seems scary when the kids are just sitting there thinking, but many times I realize if I'm not getting the results I want, it's because I haven't allowed my students enough time. So I always tried to kind of make a new pack every year at the beginning of the year to make sure that I was going to do better with that situation. Same thing with who's doing the writing. It's one of the reasons that, that I'm a big advocate of interactive writing as well as shared writing um, and lots of talk before writing when we are doing writing uh, with our instruction with our students so that they get a chance to, you know, do everything from learning how to do the strokes, how to make the letters, how to blend and, and, and stretch and sound out words and spell words, all the way to compose what they want to write as well as actually writing it. Because those kids that are doing that, they are also doing the teaching and the learning and helping with that. In this picture, this is this is demonstrative of how much I am very, very determined in my lessons to involve the kids because I want them to be doing some of that teaching too. However, I also am the teacher, so I am going to be monitoring and I'm going to be assessing whether or not what they're going to be teaching is what I need to be getting out there. So when I am listening in, to my students when I have them talking with each other during my lessons. I'm listening in and then I'm coaching them. If they're, not, if they're not ready to get up and share out, I will coach them. And then I try very diligently to get my students up, not just one at a time, but as much as I can in their little partnerships where they feel that safe environment in that classroom where they're able to get up and talk about what they just learned and share it with their fellow classmates. I try to make those instructions clear. I want them to be making their, their knowledge clear. I want them working together. One of the things that we know that students need to know every day on a daily basis is what they are doing, why they are doing it. They need to have a reason, not just because I told them, but why, and then how do I know when. I know that Doug Fisher and Nancy 
right? When in their right when their um, book assessment capable learners, visible learners, they talk about this at length because it is important that our students are knowledgeable about what it is they're supposed to be learning and. If there's something we need to do every day, it is definitely this. We need to make sure we provide clarity every day. Because if we don't understand it, we can't teach it. And we want them to understand it so they can learn it and take it away. We really want to ensure that we are providing our students with real resources. Real resources every day. Real resources that they help us to create. Real resources that are not just wallpaper in our classrooms, but things that they can go back and reference. In this case, this, this is a great example to me of student achievement. These students are working. They're doing the work. They're, they're going back over things they've said. They're even noticing the bullet. They're noticing key details. And they're discussing it. And the teacher gets a very valuable time to listen to what they're saying. And this is how this all started. This started here. This started with those students being able to know, hey, we are talking about identifying main topics. We're talking about finding key details. We're talking about finding informational text and informational facts about these animals and how they move. And from the get-go, they know what they're doing. And at the end, they have a resource that they can use to write about it, to talk about it and to further their knowledge about that topic and how to access that informational text. Because we are definitely the single most important factor in accelerating their reading growth. They don't accelerate it by themselves. They need our teaching. They need fix-up strategies. They need to know how to get their mouths ready. They need to know how to check the picture. They need to know how to ask themselves what would make sense, what would sound right, what would look right. Um, they need to look for parts. They know all those things that we know are important. And we need to have something in our rooms uh, at the appropriate grade levels with our, with, and the, the appropriate grouping of students that help them to know what to do when they come to words they do not know or they're struggling with that. Because understanding that small changes can make a big difference in that student achievement. So one of the things that, that I'm also hugely in favor of are anchor charts. Anchor charts to me are one of the best ways to provide our students with what I call mental, mental Velcro of anything that I know. So when we provide that mental Velcro, we're doing those, we're anchoring that learning and doing those things during whole class and shared reading here. You see I have we have some texts we've all been reading, we've been reading together in that shared read. Uh, and then they've been coming up with answers, discussing with their partners, and we're writing it on the chart. And that chart becomes a resource for them because they are the ones who came up with what should go on that chart. That's why I love those types of charts. And they're engaged and they're empowered and they feel like they have been part of that. I always say I do two types of anchor charts. I do informational anchor charts that I might have procedures that I've or I kind of pre-make these informational charts. You know, these are the procedures and sometimes if it's a procedure thing I might do it with the kids as well concepts, directions, regularly needed information. I may have it, I may make it one time and then I pull it out and go over it with them a lot. Um, for instance, I want them to know what those question stems and those, those sentence frames are that help them to express evidence-based terms, what they found in the text. Um, for my older kids, I want them to be able to understand how to paraphrase. I know I struggle getting kids to put things in their own words. Put that in your own words, you say. Well, you know, they don't know how to do that. So in order to clarify that, this, this is a great little anchor chart for that. And going through that and having the kids have that to be able to go back and reference is a great way to make that happen. Um, two types of text we have. We have informational text. We have literature text. How do you read it differently? What do you look at? You know, the, I love the little eye pick thing, how you pick good books uh, that you want to read. That just another little mnemonic device. Uh, little acronym to help our kids to remember what to do and how to choose books that are good for them. Book shopping. In my classroom, I always had book shopping. Uh, different days, my kids would go to the classroom library as well as to the school library, of course, to uh, refresh their book boxes and to, to have books that they, number one, want to read and number two, they need to read. So that good balance of that is so important. Um, 
different things like text codes, how they respond. These, these can help students to focus. I'm going in to find, go find a part that you really like. Find a funny part. Find a, something that's really wild when you read it. You know, it's a great little resource for them to have when they've got that Anna's, like you see Anna's response journal there. That's Anna's little journal that she is going to be writing about what she's reading that day. And those text codes, that text code anchor chart can be a great resource for Anna as she begins that. You know, what do writers do? Think, draw, label, write. You know, great little reminder when, especially with the little pictures and icons that go with it, to help our students to know what it is they do. You know, color coding can also be very supportive and add clarity in our anchor charts when we color code certain things. Uh, when we're trying to help them remember how to write stories and uh, the things that they do first and then next. All of these are informational type um, anchor charts that we use again and again and again with our kids to remind them uh, what, those, what those things are they need to know. The second type of anchor charts that I use are, I call them standards charts. You know, they, they, will have the, they might be focused on a specific uh, TEAK standard uh, that has a particular skill or strategy in it. And I want my kids to have interactive student input with these charts. These are charts we make together. They're teacher-led and they're student-driven. So we, they're created with and by the students with that teacher support. You see, I'm right there. The kids, I've gone around, I've listened in. They've told me what they, what they want to put there. They go up, they put it there. Or if, in some cases, I write it for them. just depends. Um, this is an example of taking the TEAK standards and kind of how I will go in classrooms and be able to help those students to access the knowledge about how to be able to make and confirm predictions using text features and structures in a text as they do in kindergarten or in first grade describing the main characters and the reasons for their actions. I want them to know they've got to find the characters and they're going to find the actions. Then they're going to find the motivations, why the characters are doing those actions. And taking a small part of that text and going in and doing close reading there with the students and analyzing that and putting those if that information from that particular text on that anchor chart can be invaluable to how they go to their next text and be able to describe that. Same thing as you see here with the second grade and a third grade. Same type of, of process where we're ready there for, those, for the kids' input. You know, I pre-make this, but then we're ready for the input. You can even laminate some of these and just, and just redo them uh, with the, a different text with using uh, wipe off or with using uh, sticky notes, as you can see here. Understanding how difficult it is to, looking at, looking at the comprehension uh, standard from TEKS in fourth grade, we can explain the interaction of the characters and the changes they undergo. Well, I, that's, a, that's a challenging thing for students to do. And understanding that they, first of all, have got to figure out who the main characters are and what actions and events and things change throughout the beginning and the middle and the end of the text. And what a great way to go in and follow that and, and record that as we go so that kids can learn how to do that in their heads and to have a deeper comprehension. Uh, and creating mental images when they're reading to deepen their understanding, understanding that authors describe things for their readers to be able to picture them in their minds, which, you know, enrich that whole reading experience for our students. This is another example of a standards chart where we're trying to look for main topic. And as you can see, these kindergarten kids would be very much ready. For kindergarten and first grade kids would be very much ready to go and write about lions and things they learned about the lions because we recorded that with them as we read. And then we were able to do a little interactive writing with them uh, so that they know how to take that information from the chart and be able to put it into sentence format and be able to write about the key details. You know, whether we're making inferences with, it, with informational text or literature text, uh, we're looking for the author's craft and the text features and how it enriches the text that we're reading. In this case, we're doing that. Here we can help our students to be able to go back later and say, remember when we look at the one about the zoo born? Uh, today we're going to look at a book that's about sea animals, and we're going to figure out what the author teaches in the words as well as in the pictures. Uh, theme, wow, theme is always a tough one. 
I have found that since I have been a huge advocate and uh, and I've been implementing using anchor charts in classrooms that students tend to retain it and are more able to go back and, and do retails and recounts and discuss the text and the central messages and themes that they learn from these texts by noticing what the characters are doing and what the actions are. Um, because they, they they have it written down, it's recorded, they see it, and they can write from it, and they can talk from it. But then we have a problem, like, what are we going to do with all those language charts? Oh, my goodness. Well, you know, there's several things you can do. You can just have it on a, you can take a picture of it. You can have it on your iPad. You can put it on your, on your teacher website. Um, you can put it in plastic sleeves and have little books. You can put it on hangers, as you see here. There's, there's an example of anchor charts that have been done previously up on the little Dollar Tree hangers uh, with the little clothes rack so that they're out of the way. Some are put up, some are out of the way, so that when the t kids need to use them, the teacher wants to refer back to them, along with the vocabulary words that are on there with sticky notes, they're easily accessible. And the students can go back and review those. It's kind of like they're, they're proud. The students from this classroom, I'll tell you, they're proud of their anchor charts. It's their work. They say, this is what we've been doing, it's what we've been learning. They like that visibility of it and being able to keep that around in some format and reference it again is working smarter, not harder. You know, they become, the anchors become valuable resources for our kids that they can see with those visible learners and they can use them as a reference to write and talk about what they are learning. This child is doing a great job of writing here because she does have an anchor chart that she can reference back because it helps stop all that how do you spell. In the classroom, talking about another way to, to get that balance of teacher talk versus student talk, one of the things that has that been talked about in depth by many folks lately and definitely something that I'm a big believer in is that raising hands can sometimes can be a thinking stopper because many students don't want to raise their hands or the students that do want to raise their hands sometimes overrun some of the ones that don't, don't give the others a chance. And so I want the kids to talk together and I want them to be partnered up. But I love this look you give your friend when the teacher says found a partner. You know, I need to establish those partners. In a classroom, I want my kids to be with the most productive person they can be with because I want them talking. And dear teacher, I talk to everyone, so moving my seat won't help. Well, yep, that can happen. We, we want them to talk. We want to encourage their talk. So we want to put them in partnerships, perhaps a trio, perhaps a duo, depending on the makeup of my class. And I want them with the most productive person I can put them with. Is this flexible? Well, the chart you see there is on Velcro. Yes, it can be flexible for sure. But in any given day, I want them to know who they're going to sit beside and who they're going to talk to whenever I am, I am giving them instruction. We're doing shared reading or we're doing many lessons about skills and strategies. And in this case, they can be A-B partners. They can be peanut butter and jelly partners. And I want to say, hey, peanut butter goes first, jelly goes first. And when the kids are talking, the teacher gets an opportunity to listen in to that talk and to see what they're doing and to get them to share with others. Building that classroom community of learners is such an important part of that. But one of the things we know, as you look back, so what's the problem with some of that? Well, the problem with some of that is our kids are not really good at being speakers and listeners, not in a way that is sustaining and highly productive, especially with the listening part. Many of our kids tend to listen with the intent to, they don't listen to with the intent to understand, they listen with the intent to reply, which I always say is kind of like they, they're waiting on the other kid to shut up so they can talk. Well, in this case, we want them to learn. We have to provide them with opportunities to rehearse and have instruction and have practice on how you listen to understand, how a true conversation can help encourage students to remember what they're learning and to deepen their understanding of a text or a skill or a strategy or a concept and to have a conversation before they flip and they become the speaker. So those roles change and the, I have found that the, the uh, speaker listener tools are a great little 
hands-on thing that helps students to know how those roles change and how those conversations uh, can be led and those little question stems can help them. So that when I'm leaning in, one is talking to the other and they're listening. They're truly listening uh, once they learn how because they know that their partner is going to be listening to them and giving them feedback. And peer interaction that way is very valuable, but it definitely has to be monitored and it needs to be, they need to be taught how to make that happen. And we need to be, do a better job at maintaining that balance of teacher talk and student talk. But we definitely want to give our students opportunities to have their learning validated, to have their voices validated, not just, I'm not your only resource. Here, notice that these two students understand what we're talking about. They, they did a really good character analysis here, so I'm going to let them tell you what they think, and, and then I want you talking about what they said. So final reflections. Wow. We've been through a lot. We've been talking about literacy tools. We've been talking about um, multiple instructional strategies and concepts and setups in our classrooms. We've been talking about balance of teacher talks with student talk. We've been talking about anchoring students' learning through visible things, including anchor charts and literacy tools like the speaking and listen and the text evidence finders. As I said, I share all of those on my website, and I'm sure that you have many, I think, many things in your own classrooms that you use. So balance in our instructional approaches, choice and use of materials, resources, and student engagement and time management is key to a successful school year. Teachers do matter most to student learning, and what teachers use and how they use their time is also important in that process. Literacy is for life. And I am very happy to say that I'm in this profession because I want to be. And all of you that are listening to this webinar are also making a difference in students' lives every day because what we teach them is what they take away and make themselves better life. So I'm going to open up the uh, board for questions at this time. And if at any time you don't, if you don't have questions now, you may have questions later, you can contact me through my website or hopefully see me out somewhere in your schools or your area. And um, so I'm going to open it up for questions. Okay. So we don't have any questions right now. But hopefully you'll have others later. Please let me know. And thank you again for joining us today and for doing the jobs that you do. And everybody have a great year. Thank you.